This is the Infrastructure Matters podcast, brought to you by the Futurum Group. We explore the latest developments in hybrid cloud computing and the technology that underpins it. In each episode, we'll dive deep into the latest trends and technologies that are shaping the hybrid cloud computing landscape. The Infrastructure Matters podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only. Please do not take anything reflected in this show as investment advice. Now your co-hosts, Stephen Dickens, Kimberly Bates, and, and Krista McComer of the Futurum Group. Hello and welcome to the second episode of the Infrastructure Matters podcast. I'm joined this week by Kimberly Bates. Hey, Kimberly, how are you? Hey, good afternoon. Looking forward to digging in. I've got the pleasure this week of being on the road and spending some time with you, and uh, it was good to catch up in person. But let's let's dive straight in here. We were both out at HPE Discover this week. Great event. Lots to unpack, whole bunch of announcements, but I'll give you the floor. Maybe you can kick us off here and then I'll dive in. Well, I'll start with one that's probably not at the top of everybody's list, but it is what's on the top of ours. It was the GreenLake for Private Cloud Business Edition. Um, we've, they already had GreenLake for Private Cloud. They did announce some expansions of that, which included the Red Hat OpenShift and a couple of other things. But the big thing on the private edition is what came out is this is a self-managed environment, um, which is different than a bunch of their other items. Um, it's on-prem or can be also in Equinix, which is really cool. Basically, they're staging these systems in Equinix so you can just flip a switch and go, um, creating that cloud-like kind of environment that's going on. Um, and as I said, it is self-managed. So it's consumption-based, but it's still the self-managed. It's based upon their technologies they've had for a long time um, that were more HCI kind of based that they're breaking out. So it's a really good solid product. It's not like a brand new code or anything. And so it should take off very well, especially for clients that may be migrating off of some older equipment over to the new, new environment. Um, but I, was I, really inter- I was really interested in the Equinix piece. I thought yeah. that made really good sense to me. You want to get out of your data center, but maybe for sovereign cloud reasons, maybe the application's got some kind of private cloud characteristics, yeah. but you don't want it in your data center. I thought that made perfect sense to me. Well, aligned with one of their big things that Aniri um, stated, he talked about Intelligent Edge, which is all about a lot about Aruba, but also about bringing um, the cloud coming to where your data is, et cetera. So recognizing how many points of presence we are going to have over the long haul. But the second one that they talked about was the hybrid cloud by design. And in there is, you know, there is a bit of you know push pull right now, and that's for another podcast about repatriation and all that kind of things that are kind of like seem to be exploding all over the place. But this concept of hybrid cloud by design is to say give me the ability to have something that I can stand up and go run pretty quickly. And so they were calling it the VM vending machine, which, you know, was kind of cute, but they are offering out there. And essentially by pre-positioning these things into the Equinix, and I think there's seven locations, is that Mm -hmm. what they said? Mm -hmm. They'd be able to flip, you'd be able to go in there and flip the switches if you were setting up um, in a a private cloud someplace. So yes, it is a, it's going to be a nice, should be a very nice offering. Haven't seen the pricing, and that always has to come to share. So we need to take a look at the pricing. So what else did you get? Yeah, the other one from HP you discovered for me was the um, the Green Lake for large language models. Unsurprisingly, <laughs> HP made an AI announcement, but this one was a little bit different. I've got a call, a briefing this week that the team are trying to set up to go into more detail on it. But what I took away from the initial briefing and then a couple of the one to one kind of discussions was that they've packaged up compute GPU access put this into initially a pretty sustainable data center in Quebec, and they're going to be able to offer a consumption-based AI model in the cloud. Now, there's 
a small a smaller startup, which I think caught both you and I out about who they're partnering with for, for the large language models piece. But I think foundationally, this for me is going to be access to GPUs in a in a sort of in a model in a consumption model. And I think if you strip this down to its basics, and I've got to understand more about the offering, but I see a shortage over the next 12 months for H100s and A100 GPUs. So if you can provide those as a service and people don't have to get in a very long line to buy them as CapEx, it's going to be interesting. Again, no pricing. Don't know how this is going to be. They're talking about um, node instances rather than kind of a full shared model so that's going to be interesting don't know how they're going to price it to your point earlier as well that's always where the the rubber hits the road but i think it's going to be interesting to see how that model sort of takes off for sure well and the other piece of that is they are using and leveraging their cray expertise which is crit is really big um They've over the years they've picked up a couple of companies, Determined AI, Pachyderm, which is data workflow, um, Determined AI, machine modeling, and that in that layer of enablement software um, should simplify the use and the leverage of the Green Lake for large language models. Um, and I think we're going to talk a little bit more about that later, but on on all the announcements that are happening. But that was the third and third um, layer that um, Mary talked about, which was the usable data that, you know, enabling the AI environment for the entire market. So yeah, I mean, and a precursor to probably what we will see is a supercomputing as a service over time. Yeah, they were hinting towards that and we'll have to see that come out. But they've certainly got the HPC chops to be able to do that. I mean, my takeaway from the event overall was really starting to lean into where the market is is going. So they've been early on consumption models. I think they were the first of the big vendors to really pivot the entire company towards GreenLake. Lots of work going on around rebranding and simplification from a marketing point of view. So I think we're going to see a slicker message from them. But Antonio Neri's definitely in his stride. He was on main stage saying he'd done six HBE Discovers. You could just tell, I think <laughs> we talked about it. This is just a comfort that he's picked the strategy early. He's got into private cloud. He's got into consumption. He's pivoted the company over maybe the last four or five years. Now they're starting to see that really gain traction. Would you agree? Is that what you picked up? I know we spent some time talking about it. Well, he did cite some numbers um, that were up there. I believe it was um, 10 billion in contracts, uh, 1.1 in ARR, um, which is pretty you know, significant numbers that are going for Green Lake. You know, it's a question we've had, you know, is it all consumption based? Is it all managed based? It's a combination of all of that the people are latching into debate, depending upon their financial metrics and what they're looking at. But there is that piece of it is once you supposedly lock into an you know an as a service, it's that renewal kind of process that is a little bit more difficult to um, probably unwind. Um, and as, or the other flip side of it, as long as you are delivering well on the service and the service level agreements, um, you're, you've got a very strong um, probability of you know renewals, which is was another interesting thing that came back on that private cloud offering, the BE private cloud offering um, business edition, as well as the private cloud offering period for GreenLake. Um, they all have six nines SLAs. Mm -hmm significantly big bigger number than you will find you know um that on an aws or azure uh, so it's, it's their commitment to, to delivering the service to the client yeah and i think that's one of the criteria for me if you're looking at private cloud availability mm -hmm. you know there'll be data sovereignty there'll be other non-functional requirements but i think if you're demanding from an availability point of view and you really want to get into the guts of how that data is replicated and the clustering and the, how the hardware works, and you do want to get your hands somewhat dirty, yeah. Yeah. something like a Green Lake is going to make a lot of sense for that, I think. Yeah. 
Um, the other um, show that we were at recently, I did not attend, but um, one of our peers, uh, Randy Kearns, was there at the Pure Accelerate mm-hmm. that was held. Um, we did. You know, they did some announce big announcements there um, with the Flash Array slash slash X. It's never easy to say in the slash SC. Um, basically, there was big updates on there with the Sapphire Rapids from Intel, PCIe Gen 4, DDR5 memory, et cetera. So they, with that new update, they have a 40% performance incre- and a 30% compression increases with the, the direct compress accelerators. What's really cool about that is since a lot of clients have the evergreen um contract meaning that if you have the um high level you know premium support contract with them every three years you get an upgrade in that in your controller and so that you're not paying anything for that 40 percent performance boost you're paying but you're already paying for the premium so so that's a real real nice kick up um they also added in um, a bigger flash array C model. The C model is their big QLC models that they've come out with. Um, frankly, basically saying, hey, you know, guys, we can, um, you know, take over the HDD line, which is now their latest and greatest discussion in the market space. Lastly is the Flashblade E, um, which is supposedly priced to take on directly disk-based systems. And, um, it's one to four petabytes raw. Uh, so, I mean, we're going to see some, you know, some rattling of the sabers out there like we've seen before. Um, it has a 75 terabyte direct flash module, uh, significantly big module that they're developing themselves. I mean, remember, I don't know if I'm sure if you were watching Pure when they first came out many years ago, but they were all about off the shelf stuff. Um, and now what they are is all about the custom design because they have figured out that they can really get a whole lot more out of the systems when they do the custom design. So all in all, good show. Clients were um, from and talking to Randy, the, you know, the clients were very engaged. It was much a whole lot more energy um, this year. But, you know, I think everybody finally crawled out of the COVID uh, <laughs> cages and are back out there. Um, although, folks, I've got a friend that had COVID this last week, and she's really super sick. So oh, God. I'm watching for the stuff. Um, anyway, so that was the stuff with Pure Accelerate. So bigger, ba- better, faster was the takeaway, you think, from the show? I mean, lots of product announcements that sound like their performance. Anything architecturally changing or just same as before, but just bigger and faster? I, I think it's more bigger and faster. Um, you know, they did some things at hardening for ransomware. Um, they, one of, they announced a ransomware recovery SLA for Evergreen 1. Um, what that is, it's an add-on. You have to pay for it. But Pure will ship a clean storage system to you the next day that's got an isolated recovery. So let's say you go belly up on your – you didn't have your data protection and security wrapped down. You got locked down, et cetera. You can't unlock that box. They're going to ship that box to you uh, next day for you to get st- stood up and going, you know, to set it up. So um, nice – Nice offering, um, you know. It's kind of again your insurance policy if you want to spend spend the money for it. And um, and I a, think some of the big banks and the telcos and the retailers may well do that. I mean, I think belt braces, suspenders, kind of everything from a <laughs> security point of view. I yeah. can see that getting traction. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of that, that one. So we're we're on to maybe we get a breather for a couple of weeks before um, we have to go get back on the road again. So I yeah, July fourth, people maybe sort of slow down. I know we're, we're both. You know what July fourth is? I, I've heard about it. I've heard about it. Um, <laughs> maybe best if I don't comment with this accent on July fourth. No, thank you. <laughs> so uh, I mean. Latter part of the week, I was out at MongoDB. That gives us a nice segue into some of the stuff we're seeing around kind of the whole AI space. So I'll maybe summarize MongoDB. And then I think they've changed their events. So I've been going to MongoDB World or whatever it's been called now since 2015. They've changed the event now. They're doing it instead of like a couple of big events around the world. I've been to it in London as well. 
They're now taking it on the roll on the road with MongoDB local. So it was an action packed one day event in the Javits Center in New York. Really good to see kind of all the content in one place. Um, lots of announcements, vector search, you know, obviously a lot of focusing on AI and providing sort of where they're going to fit in the stack. I think some of the biggest things, and I tweeted about this as part of um, Dev's keynote, was just the sheer volume of traction that they're getting. I think it was, yeah. I'd have to check the numbers, but I think it was 43,000 customers now. I mean, I've been tracking MongoDB, as I say, from 2015. They're now a really established, big database company, really sort of taking um, taking share, I think, as people think about new applications and cloud native, they're really starting to bolster their presence. And, and some of the names and vendors that they were talking about partnerships with, you know, a lot of that work now is coming on at, on Atlas from a cloud perspective. So they've seen that explode. I think it was 2017 or 18 that they lo- launched Atlas. So that's now over 50, maybe even over 60% of their revenue. So I think as developers are looking to launch those cloud native applications, MongoDB is starting to become, you know, w- at least one of the default choices as you're looking for that database architecture to support. So fascinating event, lots of announcements. I wrote a piece um, which we can put in the show notes that covers that as always lots and lots of product drops, new releases, new functionality, but lots to take away from that event, I think. Yeah. So that gives us a segue. Enterprise AI, I just wrote, literally published a piece on Forbes. There's a lot going on in this space. We just talked about what HPE is doing with large language models. Maybe we spend a bit of time just lots this space seems to be evolving on a daily basis there's an, a new product announcement somebody's launching something what what's your take Campbell? i don't believe it's a flash in the pan <laughs> that's the, that's the one thing i'm going to say i don't think it's a flash in the pan although you know there is the hype that we'll have and it will have a, a tapering effect but mm-hmm. Um, one of the things that uh, Antonio Neri talked about in the private Q&A, and I can't quote the numbers, but I will allude to it. I'm sure he'd be happy that I do. Um, was the increase in their pipeline based upon in the last 120 days. That is directly related to AI and it's significant uptick. Um, I believe if we went to Dell, we'd see the same thing. Um, I think you got the same kind of feeling coming out of Lenovo. Yeah, um, I did. I you did know, exactly. but, but hearing that coming out of, you know, the Microsoft, and I'm sure that, you know, IBM would chime in on the same thing. So there is this, this rush that's going on. Um, we think this is an easier path than where we have been over the last four to four or five years of trying to get to AI. If you recall, probably five years ago, talking to one of, one of my buddies that's a CIO um, advisor, um, and what he was doing is you had these um, centers of excellence for AI, and they were more or less putting up environments just to figure it out, mm-hmm. you know what was going on. and. They, there wasn't a whole lot of success coming out of them. We were hearing some of the success stories. And I know that like IBM had their garage events, or I think it was called garage events that they were doing to help customers identify something that they could get to over in a quick 90 days and get to something that was deliverable. But it's been a real struggle to get to something that has been really truly of value to the enterprise. This has got the potential to move very quickly mm-hmm. as we streamlined how we interact with the technology. We figured out that we can take a huge amount of data that we already have and do something with it and train it. Now, the training models are going to take a bit to get out there and get solid, 
we've already seen and heard about a couple of visible, not necessarily chat GPT failures, but failures that were along this line um, that had to get pulled back. I think we're going to see, I suspect we'll see a couple more coming out in, in the fall as they get ready to launch them and put them out and say, hey, let me pull back. But that's based upon the amount of training it has to do. So I'll, I'm going to stop. I can keep on talking if you want me no, to. No, no. I mean, it's interesting. <laughs> or you can interrupt me and say, hey, I'll take on from here. I'll say one more thing. This is There is a little bit of debate. Dell launched Project Helix, which we can talk about. You had HPE bring out their Green Lake for large language models. Project Helix has got to focus on major, maybe small language models, containers, that I can set up in my environment. HPE is looking at it and saying, I have to have my large language models. They've mm -hmm. got to train on this very, very large environment. That's going to be an interesting debate. Yeah, I mean, I think my take on it so far, and it's evolving, is every vendor's jumping on the opportunity to launch something. I don't think that is just getting on a bandwagon. I think they've genuinely had these technologies in the in so in sort of back rooms being developed over the last couple of years, maybe over the last three months they've turned the speed up to a level mm -hmm. to get them out, as we saw with the the Green Lake stuff from from HPE. They haven't invented that and brought that to market in the last two weeks. It's been in development for a, a bunch of time. Yes, Antonio's probably lit a fire under the product management team to get it out for Discover, and maybe more naturally it would have been back end of the year. But we're, And the same from um, Devitcher area for, at MongoDB. I think they probably would have naturally launched some of the vector search and some of the AI stuff later on in the year, but they've probably turned the speed up. But I think all this was coming anyway. I think what we're going to see, and and as I say in this Forbes article, I think every vendor in the next 60 to 90 days is going to launch something for AI. But it's going to be interesting to see how that enterprise AI stack starts to firm up. You know, every vendor is going to have to find their place in the stack, put their flag on it and go, we're going to do this, you know, um, Dell and, and HPE and Lenovo are probably going to go after that infrastructure piece. People like Elastic and MongoDB are going to go after maybe search and some of the, the data data components. I think all the attention is on public generative AI. Mm -hmm. I think what you and I are getting access to is all of the big players establishing a role and a position in enterprise AI. I think we're going to see you know, Google and Microsoft and maybe one or two others fight it out in that space. I heard over the weekend that uh, one of the big social media uh, networks spent a billion dollars with NVIDIA in the last 90 days. So I think we're going to see that public generative AI space. You know, my kids asking um, questions on Snapchat AI, you know, so we're going to see that space evolve, but I think where the the big money in this space is going to be spent is going to be on those enterprise models. And that's going to be fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Totally fascinating. And, and I, you know, have that belief. And I, I know I've said this before that if a CI, CEO is not looking into how this impacts their, um, their P and L or their balance sheet, um, they are behind the game. And it says, yeah, I think it goes back to when we started implementing, I mean, okay, I'm going to age myself again. When we started implementing transaction systems, mm -hmm. the transactional systems had a huge impact. We went from a batch systems to transaction systems that were really truly online in real time. Now we're going to something that is not only real time, but it's human trained by our information and the data that we've gathered over the many years. And then hopefully, <laughs> if they do it right, human guardrails. Yeah. Um, because there's a lot of questions or issues that, you know, as smart as the computers can be, they're only as smart as, you know, zeros and ones and, and how we train that. And the more data we give it, the better it's going to be over time. 
Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that. It was I literally had a briefing today from the op, the Red Hat OpenShift team. They made some announcements at their event a few weeks back, and I got a chance to double click on that today around OpenShift AI. And the team were doing the sort of classic feature drop. It does this. It does mm-hmm. this. And on page five, they had a piece around notices bias in models. And I kind of stopped them and went, guys, that can't be on chart five on the fourth bullet. Mm-hmm. That's got to be right up at the top because I think, as you say, people are going to start to get paranoid about bias in these models. Mm-hmm. Being able to, this was kind of the plumbing of how a model gets put into an enterprise and containerized. So it was a pretty technical sort of space. But I think it's going to become a C suite concern especially one of the examples we were talking about is mortgage processing. If you've got a mortgage approver denier AI platform, and that's denying people in underrepresented groups in a, for reasons that it shouldn't, that's a front page news if they get found out mm-hmm. with that type of stuff. So I think increasingly the C-suite is going to want to understand where these models come from, how were they trained, how were they deployed, and I think it's less about some of the plumbing of how that happens and gets put in a container. It's going to be increasingly become an ethics and bias and kind of are we a good steward of AI and our, our corporate data. So I think it's going to be fascinating as we see this space evolve in the next. And it's evolving on a daily basis. It seems to be every day there's a new announcement that we need to track. Well, when we were with Dell uh, talking to um, John Rose, and some of the things that they have already done to clean up their data, if you will, data being documentation, code development, et cetera. So there's a lot of terms that we use um, that are maybe are not nowadays politically correct, if you will, or could be misconstrued. So white hat, black hat, Mm -hmm. slave master, which we've always used with, you know, in terms of talking about databases, right? Um, and there's a myriad of other terms that they've been through and they started going through quite a few years ago to clean up their data and, and their environments. So um, that is one of the things before it starts getting put into the systems, that kind of scrutiny has to be, people have to go through and scrutinize their information that they have before they put it in the system. Because once you train it, it's going to be a little difficult to untrained mm-hmm. um, <laughs> i think i mean i'm not i'm not a data scientist or professional but i think it would be better to to clean it up before you drop it in um than sure. to clean it up after the act so yeah, fun. <laughs> i mean i think on this podcast over the next few weeks as we sort of cover the infrastructure of ai it's going to be in a rapidly evolving space yeah yeah well that's this week's episode. You've been listening. There we to- go. There we go. <laughs> We've covered it. We man, it's amazing how fast these go, Kimberly. So really great to talk to you as always. Um, uh, we'll we'll be together at, uh, next week. We seem to be on the road together at the moment, which is great. Um, thank you very much for listening. This is the Infrastructure Matters podcast. Please click and subscribe, and we'll see you on the next episode. And you can find us on LinkedIn as well, Kimberly Bates. And Stephen Dickens on LinkedIn and Twitter for me as well. So we'll see you next time. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, guys. Bye.